Thank you for um, sticking around until the last session of the conference. I can uh, imagine you're already quite exhausted after so many sessions. So um, we are going to present on deploying and hosting EPSI nodes based on Hyperledger Bezu. So first, a short introduction. Um, I'm Shane de Koning. I'm Web3 Lead at Hoest University of Applied Sciences in Bruges, Belgium. And I'm here together with my colleague, Robbie Hooting, who is an um, infrastructure and Web3 engineer. I will, Robbie, later when he presents, let him more introduce himself. A short intro where we're from. So at our university, we have 26 bachelor programs 12 associate degrees and many postgraduate certificates, all with a strong practical focus. And next to that, we also have research and innovation labs with a clear focus on applied research. Um, yes, we have great research teams. And what we have at the core of our applied research is the quadruple helix. So this means that we combine the academic, the government, the industry, and the citizens. We really believe to have powerful applied research that you need to do it together. Web3, um, it's a broad word with many definitions. For us, it's quite a simple one. We say we address the power imbalances and limitations that are inherent to Web2 technologies. We focus mainly on uh, distributed ledger technologies, decentralized storage solutions, and decentralized identity and ownership. And we are really open-minded towards all technologies. At the bottom, you see some icons of technologies we have been using so far, but uh, it's not limited to this. What um, we are offering regarding Web3 is we offer education through our bachelor program, Applied Computer Science. We organize master classes, which are online in English and can be flexibly followed. And we are also working out some postgraduate degrees. We do applied research. Um, these can be multi-year consortium projects where we bring together organizations and um, build proof of concepts with them. Or we can do test before invest. So a lot of enterprises before they um, can really make big investments regarding new technologies, uh, we can enable a way for them to gain experience and to, to find funding. Next to this, we also provide services, um, consulting and workshops, and we organize events. Last Thursday, we had a Hyperledger meetup in Bruges on the topic of Web3 Evolved and the European shift to decentralized technologies. And we are also proud that every year we organize a decentralized autonomous hackathon, which is a hackathon that is run completely on the smart contracts including the voting and awarding the prize. But actually, I'm here to talk mainly about our work with EPSI. EPSI is the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure. Um, we have done two early adopter projects with them. We are also issuing um, digital student cards through EPSI in collaboration with KBC Bank in Belgium, where actually the, the student card is issued as a verifiable credential. And then also together with Belnet, we are, and Belnet is the Belgian, uh, is a Belgian hosting organization. We are uh, hosting a EPSI node for Belgium, but this will be come clear more soon. So what is the challenge that um, EPSI currently with SSI is trying to solve? It is that um, verification matters. So 
Here you can see in 2020, 9% of EU consumers were tricked into buying a fake product. One in three EU consumers was doubting if, they, if there was a real product or possibly a fake product. And 6% of EU imports are attributed to counterfeit and pirated goods. In another area, in education, the hiring managers, 60% uh, of hiring managers reported catching fabrications on job applicants' uh, uh, resumes. So if you see, if you need to replace an employee, it can cost between $3,500 and $40,000. I'm not that fast in converting it to yen, but it's a lot of money. So how do you combat fake? Well, then you verify. We have an example. So my colleague, Robbie, <laughs> he studied uh, applied computer science, or that's at least what he claims to have studied. Is it true or is it false? H here we see two axes. We see the time it takes and how much we can trust it. The easiest thing would be if I go to LinkedIn and I see at the bottom that of his profile page that indeed Robbie said that he studied applied computer science at Hoest. But it's easy to do. I can type whatever. I can, yeah. The next thing is I can ask Robbie to send me a scan of his degree. What some do in a degree is they, they put a hard stamp, so you see something. So that I have heard stories that they ask, can you please, with a pencil, write on it so we can see the stamp in the PDF. But still, it's not great. Third one, I could ask Robbie, can you show me your paper diploma? But you see it's already taking more time and it's cumbersome to get that paper version. Or I could contact Hovest directly, the university where he studied, and ask, is it true? But that might take a long time. Maybe I never get an answer. But also, it carries the risk that um, for the privacy of Robbie. Maybe Robbie is, uh, wants to be recruited with a competitor <laughs> of the or the university he studied. So how can we solve this? With Web3, so with technologies as digital wallets, verifiable credentials, and blockchain, we can actually make it happen fast and with a lot of trust. Yeah. So here, um, I will explain how this works. So in this system, you have issuers, holders, and verifiers. And this is a typical diagram of a self-sovereign identity. So the issuer, in this case, would be the university. They issue a verifiable credential that actually um, claims that Robbie graduated in applied computer science at Hoest. Robbie would store this in his digital wallet. So that is not on the blockchain, that would be in his wallet. And then Robbie, when he wants to present it to the company or the organization where he wants to prove it, he can make a presentation. Now, in a typical scenario, if you don't have this decentralized network, the verifier would have to check straight to the issuer, is it true? That is what happens if you log in to a website with Google, then the verifier redirects you to Google, you log in to Google, and then Google will say it's okay to the verifier, but that leaks privacy. Then every time Google knows where you are browsing, with this model, the verifier does not have to go to the issuer. 
And that is because at the bottom, you can see EPSI, the European blockchain, where what is on the EPSI blockchain, you have the public keys of the issuers, you have a register of the issuers, so Hoest as university, yeah, Hoest as university is on there in that list, recognized as university by our Ministry of Education. And in case Robbie would have cheated, what he would never do, then also there's a mechanism to revoke to see if a credential is revoked. So because the issuer, Hoest, signed the credential and that, cr that signature is in that, veri in that verifiable credential, the verifier can easily check it by asking the public key of Hoest through the ledger and they can verify if it's true. What I just demonstrated for a diploma, it can be applied to many scenarios. You can issue claims about almost anything. So what is the vision of EPSI? Um, so you can see that in the European Union, we have quite a specific political situation. We have lots of member states in the European Union. And actually in European Union, there's the European Blockchain Partnership and all, yeah, lots of member states and also Norway and Liechtenstein are part of it. And so all of them are running a node each in their member state. And then through that blockchain and through the services built upon it, there are transparent services that everyone can use. Um, it's also contributing to data spaces, which is something in Europe, a name we use to, we don't want one giant data monopoly. We provide that there's more spaces where data resides as sovereign as possible. And also that it's in line with our regulations, such as the GDPR for the privacy, etc. You can use it in almost every sector. You can use it in education, um, tax, mobility, social security, health, and through the further innovations on EPSI, it will also be possible for product and materials traceability, copyright, anti-counterfeiting, E receipts, etc. There are already a lot of um, pilots being done. So, currently, already more than 350 organizations from both private and public sector have used it uh, from more than 30 countries. And you, yeah, you can see actually our university is also there, part of the early adopters program involved in two cases. So what kind of use cases are they now empowering? Uh, there's formal uh, pilots between Greece and Switzerland regarding formal accreditations so that if you want to do have higher education in another country from Greece to Switzerland, that it can be recognized automatically your diploma. The second one is my academic ID. That's uh, the cards you get when you're a student somewhere, that this can be more recognized in many countries. University alliances. We have alliances of universities that um, if you're in another university, part of the same alliance, that you can also access some facilities that is being piloted. Regarding vocational education, there's also pilot happening. Public uh, services in Spain uh, also have a use case where between the regional and the national administration that it's more easy because maybe you also already experienced it can be confusing as a citizen if you have to bring documents and they don't, yeah, sometimes even you need a double. The European Intellectual Property uh, Organization has, uh, together with the logistics um, 
sector use case regarding product authenticity. Europass um, actually works on uh, student wallets that actually makes it easier for students across Europe. And then also regarding social security uh, in Italy and through ESS Pass. These are only some, there are all the time, there are more coming. The reason why they are doing these use cases is that they really want to also test and grow the model uh, step by step. Every use case you add, you learn more and you see, okay, maybe you need this or this option. This is quite different from the permissionless public Web3 world where a lot is built and they fix it after. Here they, it's through the government, it's the other way around, it's step by step and to bring something that might be a com commodity. Okay. And then the last part of me before I bring it to my colleague. So technically we have been high, yeah, coming, coming actually from the use now to the technical, what is underlying. So what is underlying is that there's verifiable credential exchange framework profile, that there are trust models, both to trust issuers, but also can you trust the verifier? Because in some cases, as Robbie will explain, might be important. How actually does revocation work? Which options do we have? Um, then which wallets there are, and then also um, trusted registries of organizations. So. All right, thank you, Shane. Um, I'm Robbie Hutink. I'm also from the West University and I'm an infrastructure and tree engineer, and I will go a little bit more into technical detail. I don't know if this is the clicker or the other one. All right. Okay, so what is EPSI today? EPSI today is a user-centric, uh, decentralized and reusable uh, in many contexts. Uh, what they actually provide are the bottom two layers, uh, the EPSI ledger and APIs, as well as the EPSI verifiable credentials that are built on top of the ledger. Um, these things are built with uh, Bezu, so they are built with uh, open source software from the Hyperledger Foundation. Um, and we invite the open source community to help build uh, applications that connect to these APIs and build use cases uh, that continue the work of EPSI. As Shane already mentioned, we have a couple of trusted lists that are implemented by the decentralized network because our philosophy, EPSI is a project about decentralization. We want to deliver added value to our users for that, uh, reason, EPSI supported a uh, decentralized network and as far as we've experimented with this, distributed ledger technologies are the best uh, option in this market. Uh, we want to limit the use of blockchain as much as possible and only apply it to where it is needed and where it makes sense basically. Uh, one uh, key aspect of our philosophy is that we do not put user data on the blockchain because that creates a conflict with GDPR, etc. Um, as already mentioned, uh, EPSI Network is providing HTTP APIs. Uh, these connect to a couple of smart contracts that are deployed on the, on the blockchain uh, on the EPSI ledger. Um, in this sense, actors do not have to speak blockchain. They only have to connect to a couple of APIs for which the specifications are publicly available and therefore they don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't need to know the nuts and bolts of a blockchain for this. Our facility, uh, philosophy is to facilitate the adoption and ensure an easy integration. As I already mentioned, there are a lot of open APIs that you can connect to. You can find them if you look up uh, epsi.eu. Uh, there you can get a, a description for all the all the API endpoints that are available and how you can get more information on there. Uh, there's a detailed website to facilitate the adoption of this for IT providers. But you may ask, why ledgers? Why don't we just trust the current system that we have? The short answer is 
No, we can just trust that, but we want more. Uh, the current system is a distributed uh, static XML file in which each XML file references another. Um, and business requirements drive uh, the current state to add more synchronization, replication, traceability, and account accountability. If we add all of these um, attributes to an existing XML file, then we actually uh, come closer and closer to a distributed ledger technology or DLT, such as EPSI provides. The default static XML file, it provides a level of integrity, authenticity, and proof of existence, whereas a distributed database will add distribution and replication, because we have many databases uh, dropped around many places and you add a level of resilience to the network and you increase the performance but if you want to go a step further and add accountability to see who changed what and when uh, if you want to have a chronological set of uh, actions and data records access management uh, et uh, etc so the information cannot be deleted but only appended uh, and create an integrity or tamper-proof mechanism, then you arrive to a distributed ledger. This ensures that we can have a decentralized truth. Uh, a decentralized truth means that we have a collective truth where new information is agreed upon by all parties in the network through a consensus mechanism. Now, uh, when people hear blockchain, they often think about Bitcoin and the power consumption with the proof of work uh, mechanism. In EPSI, we rely on proof of authority, which is a whole other story in of itself. We'll not go into depth on that, but it means that we don't have the power consumption that a, a legacy uh, blockchain has. <laughs> um, there are no rewrites and all transactions are added in order. This means that all data is uh, chronologically uh, readable and due to innate uh, cryptographic properties, it cannot be changed uh, without, uh, without leaving a trace. Yeah? And even if one actor goes rogue in the blockchain network, then all other nodes can still agree on what is the truth, because that one bad actor will not change the entire blockchain without convincing all other nodes in the network to also include those bad changes. Uh, this brings us to a trusted list of uh, a distributed PKI, public key infrastructure model. Uh, based on the ledger. Uh, in EPSI, we, we talk about TAOs. Uh, these are trusted accreditation organizations. They actually sign the DID or decentralized identifier of a trusted issuer. The trusted issuer has its DID, its public facing address, if you will, not to be confused with the public key and private key. Yeah. The schema uh, shows you that you can roll your public and private keys uh, to invalidate old ones and uh, minimizing the impact if a private key is compromised, let's say. Uh, they are always linked with a timestamp because as I already mentioned, uh, the DLT provides a append-only mechanism. The DID document uh, that describes an organization will append more and more uh, public keys uh, as time goes on. This is what we call key rolling. So the information cannot be removed or modified. It can only be appended and ensures a chronological sequence of events uh, due to the ledger's immutability property. Um, and I think I already mentioned that, yeah. I don't know why I jumped back so many pages. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the onboarding process because EPSI, I don't know if Shane already mentioned it, it's a uh, public permissioned blockchain and the permission element comes from the onboarding process, how to run a node. Now, I know this may not be very suitable in the context of Japan or APAC in of itself, 
but we still wanted to include this because it might provide you a insight on how maybe you could also set up a similar system. Uh, and it, it comprises of five basic steps. The first one is you want to get an endorsement from an EDP representative. An EPSI blockchain program representative uh, is someone who represents your country on the European or EPSI council, so to speak. Uh, and if you want to run a node in pre-prod or production, you need to supply an ISO 27K certification or something similar in your local state. If it is rep present, your representative will verify and endorse it. If you cannot obtain a certificate before deploying a node, you, they are, EPSI itself is still flexible. You can proceed with the node installation, uh, but you have to wait to connect to the network. Then you have to get your certification, get it endorsed, and then connect to the network. Once you have that uh, endor endorsement and verification, you can create a ticket request uh, to uh, set up a new node. You have to fill out the form, uh, ensure the uploaded, uh, you upload the endorsement and all of its uh, attachments. If you didn't already, uh, you'll be asked to sign the relevant legal package because there's also a SLA uh, included uh, on hosting a node. So not everyone is just able to host a node. Once you get everything approved, you will get a image, which can be uh, this can be uh, a KVM or a QEMU or uh, hy any hypervisor type of image that you can run on the cloud or on premise. Um, there has to be one dedicated machine per per environment. We have the pilot environment, the pre-production, and the production environment. Anyone is free to run the pilot environment and participate in that. Uh, there are, of course, a couple of requirements for this virtual machine being in production, eight uh, CPUs, 64 gigabytes of RAM, 80 by, well, about 600 gigabytes of disk space, and, well, just short of half uh, for pre-production. Um, in order to maintain a healthy network of the blockchain, uh, it is crucial to actually have a couple of requirements. You have to have one IPv4 public address per environment, again, pilot, pre-production, and production. And you have to have direct or unrestricted access to the internet, so outgoing traffic uh, doesn't have to be, cannot be hindered. There are a couple of inbound rules, so other nodes can talk to your node, of course. Um, another big requirement is a web application firewall. Now, EPSI does not want to specify which application firewall you want to use. I recommend using an open source one because this is the Linux Foundation and we love open source. Um, but the point of this is to uh, prevent uh, attacks. Well, you cannot prevent attacks, but you can protect against attacks as such as DDoSs uh, against your node or network nodes. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, they provide in a couple of formats, KVM, VHD, VMDK, or VMware compatible uh, images. You can just download it, mount it onto your operating, your hypervisor, uh, and then log in with a default username or password, which you will be forced to change. After this, you have to configure it with a couple of uh, parameters, such as your DID that you registered, etc. And as far as the APIs running on a node, we require that there's an SLS, SSL, sorry, SSL certificates and DNS records uh, to be configured. You can use Let's Encrypt, again, uh, Setbot and Let's Encrypt. They provide very well software for most uh, web servers that you put on the front. And once the installation has been completed, it will be verified by the support office who will run a number of uh, verification steps, like have the minimum uh, specifications been me met? Is the connectivity to the other nodes uh, okay? And of the, are the containers within the instance installed and behaving as expected? After all that is said and done, you will be whitelisted. The node will be added to the whitelist and the EPSI support office will uh, add it, meaning that your nodes will connect to the network and start communicating. This communication consists of synchronizing the blockchain, 
in which you get the full history of all the blockchain so far. Once it's fully synchronized, it will become active on a network and you can start uh, using it as a node operator. Last but not least, you have to monitor your node because as I already mentioned, there's a legal package you have to sign, like an SLA, you have to keep a certain uptime and you have to have 24 seven support uh, included with that so that even during the night or during the weekend, if your node goes down, you have to be able to get it back up and running within a certain time frame. Um, it's good practice to use other open source Grafana dashboards uh, that will be included in the package. Now, what is actually running under the hood? As I already mentioned in another slide, you have the ledger and APIs that are running uh, under the hood of EPSI. On top of on the ledger, there are a couple of EPSI verifiable credential profiles. These are based on WC uh, 3C uh, credentials. Uh, their, their standards are also open source and we try to be as compatible with them as possible. Uh, on top of that is where the users, the organizations, the private and the public sector, they come in and they start building their applications and use cases on top of it. Now, uh, inside the network, you have a couple of options. Like, you can actually configure it as much as you want. You can run a couple of nodes within one organization, set up a load balancer in front of that. You can combine with other organizations and share a load balancer. Um, or there's actually even a public load balancer for the nodes that is provided by EPSI support office. Inside the network, as you can see, the data center where you deploy the virtual, the, the VM, the EPSI image, it already has a firewall table inside of it with the containers uh, running in Docker. Uh, this is the Bezu uh, container, uh, the API container, they're all inside and all you have to do is actually just set up a firewall, uh, the web application firewall as well as a network firewall uh, before it can connect to the other EPSI compliant apps and wallets. In the network diagram, we can actually see uh, that there's a, where, where each component within uh, the EPSI image is working together. Uh, like, I will not go into detail of each of them, uh, but basically that this, these are the internal workings of uh, a EPSI node. Now, um, I've actually come to the end of our presentation um, and I am wondering if you have any questions for us. Uh, make it a good one, I say. Uh, please again, uh, uh, to please t teach me uh, how, how to validate how to validate uh, uh, and uh, who is the validator? Who is a validator? Um, well, in EPSI currently we're one of the, we're becoming one of the node validators. Do you mean a, a verifier or a node validator? A node validator is someone uh, like our public college. We, we, we are a node validator for the member state of Belgium. There can be many. It can be a public institution like ourselves uh, as a college, or it can be a private organization as well. Anyone can become a, a, a validator, uh, but they have to go through the process of the onboarding. Yeah, The five steps that I explained, these are the steps that you have to take to become a validator node. However, if you want to be a verifier, this can be anyone. Uh, let's say that I say I made the claim that I studied computer uh, sciences at Hoest. Anyone, if I want to go to a job offer and that uh, company wants to verify that I am, that I have studied uh, applied sciences, then they have to well. They can verify it uh, even without uh, being on the blockchain itself. They don't have to run a node. They can just use, they can trust the credential that I present them through cryptography uh, in of itself. 
Ah, yeah. uh, very important in that is that all uh, the wallet that you have to use uh, has to be FC compliant. So there open there's an open source com there, there's many companies that provide uh, wallet softwares, but the wallet software has to be FC compliant to receive FC credentials on it. I want to know, uh, 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 mechanism, uh, 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 how, uh, 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 approve, uh, uh, the Bitcoin, uh, for, for example, Bitcoin, uh, uh, Proof of work. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, winner of calculation. Yeah. Uh, this mechanism. Ah, uh, you want to know know more about the uh, proof of authority uh, mechanism? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay, perfect. Uh, the proof of authority mechanism uh, is a consensus mechanism that actually uses like okay. And that's why we go through the entire process of the onboarding. Yeah, uh, not anyone is allowed to run a node. So anyone who complies with the process and is uh, tested and validated by the network, they become a node operator. And these nodes, they can create new blocks in the blockchain. This, I don't know the internal mechanism. I think it's going to be a round robin, uh, depending on their availability. But each block. Each operator sometimes has to add a block and then uh, propagate it through the network. There is no mining. There is no. Uh, there's no coin added to it. So there's no. So there's no cryptocurrency involved in this process. Uh, round robin token. No, there's no token. It's a. It's not a. It's not a cryptocurrency network. It's a. It's a distributed ledger technology. Uh, so it's actually like uh, an advanced form of a distributed database where you have um, more accountability and add only or append only systems in place. Um, that that's the aspect of a permissioned network, if you will. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a randomized process. Like, uh, if four of people in the room are a node uh, validator, then I will pick blindly one of four uh, who are uh, gonna add the next block. Uh, random. random, yeah, random or round robin. It depends. It can be any uh, can be different kind of mechanisms. Uh, but because we have this uh, onboarding process. Anyone who's a node operator, we know we can trust because we have verified it before, or we have validated it before, to, confu to not confuse the terms. Yeah, and if we spot that someone does want to become a bad actor within the network, then that node will be disconnected and will be no longer whitelisted. I would say they have a blacklist, but I'm not sure about that. You're very welcome. Yes, please. I have three questions. So one thing is uh, uh, his question. So yeah. now you said making white list is an uh, actual validation for your uh, system. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, they, they actually validate. So if I go back a couple of slides, uh, I don't know. Okay, so this is the node whitelisting. So the the second point, or the first point, uh, well, the, the EPSI support office, they will go through a checklist. They will see if, you, if your node is up and running, first of all, if you have a fixed IP address, if you meet all the requirements, and even before you can get started, you have to be ISO 27K compliant and sign the legal package, yeah? So these are, a couple of items that you need to meet before you can become a node operator. So this, 
You cannot even join the network, become an operator, uh, without matching all these criteria. I see. Thank you so much. And then, the uh, second question is, uh, so why you choose a uh, uh, hyperledger bus, uh, not using uh, public? Uh, what, what is the difference point? Um, well, uh, I, I'm not an uh, internal of EPSI, so I don't know why exactly this choice has been made, but if I would have to make a guess, and it's a guess, is that uh, there are many frameworks existing, like Open Zeppelin, I don't know if you're familiar with that, that's where they host many uh, Solidity projects uh, or standards or yeah, uh, contracts where you can base yourself off, like a ERC20 token, ERC1155 tokens. They 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 have they they come. Uh, they are well tested by the community. They are well known. And Bezu is an EVM uh, compatible machine, uh, and Fabric is not. So you would have to either uh, rebuild all of that that which already exists in Fabric or you can just use what's already available also. But uh, here Shane also has a comment on this. Yeah, so actually EPSI started in 2018, and back then there was not even Hyperledger Bezu. So in the start, they used Hyperledger Fabric. So, but now what we see, also what we hear and see in the Hyperledger Foundation ecosystem in a lot of use cases, Bezu is chosen because in the public permissionless blockchain world, there's already a lot of experimentation happening. And so there's a lot of things you can try to copy within a different governance model. If next to SSI, maybe they want to facilitate security tokens or whatever in the future, it's more easy to implement because you have this ERC standard system. So, yeah, we are not internal. We say a lot we, that's because we are using their slides, <laughs> but we are very good friends. And next time I see them, I will ask and I will let you know. <laughs> yeah, if you want, you can always reach out and drop us the question on LinkedIn or via email. We're always happy to answer later. Sure, <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. And, and